And we're very pleased to have Cozy Fanny Tutti from Chris and Carter and CTI and Robin Gristle on the couch. She's been making music in all sorts of in different guises for the last 20 plus years, um, adding her voice, cornet and various electronics to their production. So we're very pleased to have Cozy Fanny Tutti. Now, when someone has a discography as long as yours, I mean, we could sit here for probably four weeks talking about the music you've made. Um, we could probably spend 84 days talking about Throbbing Gristle alone, um, but we only have 90 minutes and yeah. some time for you guys to ask questions. So we can't be definitive, we can't talk about everything. And before we even kind of go back and actually talk about the specifics of who you are and where you've come from, I thought it'd be interesting to ask something general about you and the kind of continuing creativity that you've had throughout your whole life. You're still making music and art now when lots of your peers aren't. Why do you think that is? I think the reason I started making music and the reason they started making music is probably why they've stopped doing it and I've carried on. Because I started doing music, I suppose it really began way back in 1969 when I was doing more art actions and art performance pieces, that kind of thing, um, where we used to have, um, I suppose you would look at them and think they were more like happenings, a sort of leftover from the 60s, where we would set up these weird kind of environments from anything we could collect, from old, you know, rejects from factories, all that kind of thing. And then we would take instruments along there and we would play some of the instruments um, amongst all this debris and people couldn't necessarily see us and leave instruments around for people to pick up and join in. So it goes back as far as that and the looseness of the approach to music goes back that far. So I've never been orthodox in my approach to music at all and I've never seen a reason to be. In, in fact, when I was sent for piano lessons at 11, I'd already started playing with the piano at home like a prepared piano, which my father really was disillusioned about because I should have been practising my scales and things. But I found very little of interest in me doing proper music as it was supposed to be. So, um, so I think that's one of the main reasons, is that I have a, a different interest and a different reason for doing music to a lot of my peers, mm -hmm. is that it was more a way of life for me commentating on, commenting on that and uh, my assimilation of events and everything that went on, things I wanted to communicate to people, I did through music, whereas other people did it as a career, as a way of making um, a place for them in culture and earning a living and being famous, I suppose. And I suppose a pop career is finite, isn't it? It's necessarily finite, whereas a kind of creative career perhaps is infinite, or at least as long as we continue on this Place. Yeah, totally. And I think your motive for doing it as well dictates what you do and when that ends, basically. So would you say that you've always been more interested in sound than in what you just described as proper music? Yeah, because I, I suppose as, as a teenager, I, 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 hit, I came in and, and hit the scene of um, more experimental music, really. So I, I grew up through my teens having that kind of attitude to it, to it that it, it, music stirred feelings within you. It wasn't a means of just dancing the night away, getting out of your head and then going home, working through the week or going to college the next weekend doing the same thing. You know, In fact, when, when a lot of the drugs were going around then in the 60s, I looked at a lot of my peers and saw them basically the same as I saw the people in the discotheques getting drunk. My peers were getting stoned, tripping out, doing the same thing at festivals. It was just a different thing, but they weren't doing anything with what they learned from that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, just criticizing the people that got drunk instead of getting stoned, you know, like there was some big difference. There wasn't. So, do you think maybe had you grown up in America in like the sort of 80s or 90s, you might have been a kind of straight edge girl? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I th I'm glad I'm, I was born when I was born because I <laughs> got to straddle all kinds of different movements, you know. I mean, you touched on it a second ago talking about um, using music as or music and art, although I know perhaps there isn't any difference for you as no. a way of touching on things or expressing things. Would you say that your kind of, um, sort of artistic position is about working out or sort of thinking about feelings and then finding sounds that will reflect that or communicate that? 
Yeah, because it's all about communicating, getting out there. So the means of communicating is either art actions, visual, uh, physical actions, or or with the music, and then sharing it with people, which audience is a very loose term for me because I prefer that we're all there in the same room together so it's a joint experience I'm not delivering something that they've got to be passive about I'm not interested in that so um, it's about communication and then feedback and that's what we started when TG began it was all about you know connecting with people and then connecting with other people much like here like you're doing at the workshops here where people get to you know suddenly think, oh, actually, we might not, in music terms, have anything similar to each other. But in other ways, we do have an affinity that's clicked somehow that then would really be good for a collaboration, you know. Although it's not on the surface, it seems doesn't seem likely. And it's the same with all the work we do, and we've done all these years, you know. You meet people and, and something magic happens. <laughs> Now, when people talk about kind of expressing emotion in music, there's usually a kind of um, assumption that you're talking about positive music. When people talk about emotional music, they usually mean kind of happy, love, sort of sounding music. Mm. In the kind of music that you've made, there has been music that's sounded like, but that, like that, but there's also been music that's sounded very strange and disturbing and upsetting sometimes, um, and extreme, certainly. And the visuals that went along with that also reinforced that, you know, the sort of cutting animals heads opens and opens open mm -hmm. <laughs> um do you think is it easier to make beautiful music or ugly ugly or not ugly is it easier to make beautiful music or hard and disturbing music or is there no difference for you i think when you when you're doing music that addresses really hard issues there's a kind of ecstasy at some point where it suddenly clicks and there's a beauty in it because you've located that feeling deep down inside that's made sense of something that's really hard to face, which is what we started doing with TG, and and we've continued even after TG finished, and, and I went on to do Chris and Cozy with Chris and Carter Tutti even today. We still do the same thing. And as TG regrouped, uh, the same again, is that I'm, I'm not interested in music that's trite and sings about love on a certain level that everyone can fall in love and have a family and live happily ever after you know and go through the fields of corn with the children and all that crap so i'm interested in what society culture and human beings are capable of doing to one another good and bad and the bad has to be spoken about it has to be discussed has to be assimilated and sound is a fantastic medium for that because it it sort of tweaks little nerve endings in you that bypasses any kind of um, conditioning you've had because it's a very physical thing. You can't do anything about that. So a lot of music that we do and sounds, sounds we use, that's why we use them because it's more about the sounds triggering those kind of emotions than about the lyrics or the chord changes, uh, chords or choruses. Not interested in any of that. Just the sounds that speak to people, really. I definitely noticed a kind of little uh, sort of strong twinkle appear in your eye when you were just talking about that impact that sound can have and the fact that you shouldn't be afraid of sort of what we think of as negative feelings, strong mm. kind of... Um, I don't know what, even what the word would be. We're kind of very limited in our vocabulary to talk about well, the bad, aren't we? You know, you, you get down to your gut feelings. that Certain sounds just hit you in the gut. And those are the ones that really evoke the emotions that I'm interested in when you're making music. Um, can you tell us something specific, maybe, or an idea of, of one of the records that you made, perhaps it seems we're sort of in the Throbbing Gristle area, um, which did that? Oh, God, there's so many. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. What have we got on the playlist here, TG? Oh, yeah, Hamburger Lady is a very good one, Chris. Thank you, darling. Now, you're, you're mentioning Chris. Can you tell us who Chris Carter is and what role he played within Robin Gristle? Um, he's there. <laughs> um, he was the, um, the linchpin of TG, actually, because before Chris came into the fold, there was no means of us being able you know, technically to get out what we had in our minds. 
So when he started coming to the studio and we started doing jam sessions together, that's when things really started taking off because he had the technical know-how to um, make real the um, the ideas and the um, the way that we could actually start using guitars in a different way to the norm. He knew he knew how to build certain boxes and things like that that he would do back at his flat and then come over to us in Hackney at the weekend and say, I've got this, let's try this out. So he's the linchpin, really. So I understand in the beginning, before Chris came along, you were trying to do stuff like that, so maybe taking acoustic instruments and then hooking them up to contact microphones. But then he came along and, and allowed you to do different things. Yeah, well, what it was was it in Coombe we had the the instruments there all along, but like you said, it was limited by our own knowledge of, and capability of doing anything beyond that. So um, when we, we we did a couple of performances where we used contact mics in art actions, and and did a couple of electronic festivals that way, but um, what we really needed to to do was to get away from that because it was very music concrete and it was so pretty precious area to get into for us really and we didn't really want to go in that direction and uh, the friend that we were working with knew Chris and that's how we met Chris and one of his friends had already built us um, an amp and a couple of things and then Chris came along and was building his own synths at the time and that was just like wow you know <laughs> that's, that's really where we want to be now, when I was um, trying to find out, making sure that I had sort of you know, enough knowledge about you and doing the research and whatever, and I was reading about the kind of early days of Throbbing Gristle, you think about it externally and it sounds so extreme and crazy and hardcore and full on in this very passionate way that's not afraid of looking at despair and doom and the kind of that pit of the stomach you were talking about. But then you read or hear you talking about things like you just hanging out at weekends and building speaker cabinets and making sounds and then going to the CAF and working out which sounds you liked and then going back and recording them. And it, it, that sounds different somehow to this idea of you living a very hardcore life. Um, was that how it was for you? Well, we had to eat. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's certain you know, human functions that have to take place in between mm -hmm. the creative bit. But it, it was pretty hardcore in Hackney then. It's very sort of, you know, friendly now. Mm. Um, yeah, we, we'd sort of chase through the London fields at times by gangs and that kind of thing. And, you know, we had our um, aggressive moments as well. So, yeah, it was, it was um, extreme mm -hmm. on, all, on all levels, really, because we all had, we had our separate lives as well and came together at the weekends. Mm -hmm. So and what we did separately had their extreme elements anyway. And then we came together and did things together that were extreme. <laughs> so it was a real mixed pot of, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. And so how did the kind of squat living um, affect what was happening at this time? Well, we... In terms of what? Because it was just an opportunity to get a house and get out of Martello Street studio for me and Jen. Mm -hmm. And that just came about because there was, um, funnily enough, it was a music band that we, we just sort of saw in um, the Broadway market. And they, they'd they been squatting this house in Bank Road and they just got a deal or something. And they said, why don't you just, when we move out, we'll give you the key and you can move in. And that's how we got Bank Road. Mm -hmm. But it meant that we had somewhere to live as opposed to living in a basement studio with mould, you know. I mean, in England these days, there's not really a kind of culture of people squatting houses. Again, for some of you, not, I, mean, I don't know how much squatting happens in other countries, but certainly in the UK in the 60s and 70s and maybe up till the early 80s, in cities it was relatively easy to take over a kind of a house that was empty and just live in it um, and take over. And often people use this as a way of funding their own creative lives. They would live in them, turn them into art spaces, maybe just turn them into kind of hovels, whatever. Mm. Um, but certainly there was a culture of, of squatting houses and then allowing that, of making that a way of you being able to do what you wanted to do in your life. After 12 years or something living in a house, it became legally yours. So there was this law called squatter's rights. And if you'd been there for long enough, you actually owned the place by the end of it. Um, Wish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what happened down Beck Road was that we squatted it and then as houses came empty... We told other people, and now it's a, just the whole street is just an artist community now. Mm. 
but I think most of them owned them. <laughs> they bought them in the end. Mm. Rather than waiting for their 12 years to be up. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's easier. So um, we've kind of talked a bit about Robin Gristle and those people in the audience who didn't necessarily know the music might start to get an idea of some of the sort of extremities of it as well. Um, but there was also music that came out through Throbbing Gristle that ended up being really influential for music that maybe you're more familiar with, say Detroit techno people like Carl Craig, who directly referenced the Throbbing Gristle album 20 Jazz Funk Greats on four Jazz Funk Greats. Um, you weren't aware of that connection at the time, were you? Because no, mm. not at all. Mm. We, we just worked and did what we did. We, like this sounds really not arrogant, but we weren't interested in anyone else really in the music scene then other than I mean people like the cabs the clock DVA all those kind of people that were around then and I think even some of the punk bands like Adam and the Ants all those people they used to come around sometimes you know alternative TV all those people but um, they weren't about what we were about it was still they, what they did was still rock and roll to us you know so but we still like I said you don't have to like someone's music to have something in common with them, you know. So, um, yeah, I I'm, I'm not so, you know. The bands then were, it's, it's quite weird because, because like I said before, you know, it wasn't a career to us and it wasn't a career to most of them. It was Adam and the Ants, but um, that's something else with punk. But the cabs and all those people, we, there was such a spirit of um, collaboration then because no one had much money. So whatever gear you had, you'd sort of say, look, let's do a gig and if we all go, then we can share the gear, you know. So it was as simple as that. Um, so we used to do a lot of things like that where, you know, we'd, we'd have people over and things and then just sort of jam together, that kind of thing. And also we released the Cab's first cassette for them on industrial records. Mm -hmm. Cassette. Yeah, cassette tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have a listen to something from uh, 20 Jazz Funk Greats, maybe? Yeah. You choose. Oh, that's Carl. You want Carl Craig remix? No, no, no. I want something original. Sorry, I've just got my earphones stuck in on that one. Still walking or 20 Jazz? Which one do you want? Still walking. Only if you talk about the video as well. Oh, right. Because disco was very big then, um, in the 70s, you know, you had all the um, usual Saturday Night Fever, that kind of thing going on. So that would give you an idea of how different TG was at the time. It was totally different. Um, so just looking at this, the equipment that Chris was using for that, because he did um, a lot of the prep on the music that we did, and he still does as well, um, he, he um, prepares the foundation of tracks that we all then listen to and then decide which we th feel that we can actually play along with, etc. And we make adjustments to it and so on. And there is definitely a, we can listen to something and all of us say that's either TG or that isn't, because we just know now. Um, but as I said, he was using, we, we used vibes, we managed to get some of those. Um, Space Echo, Modular System, Roland CR78, um, Drum Machine, and my cornet. I started playing cornet at the time and synths, uh, violin, guitar, through anything and anything I could put it through, played in any way but normal. Um, so that we just basically took whatever instruments and drum machines and everything else, synths, and just did what we felt right and went together properly. Um, so yeah, the cornet became quite important in TG quite by accident because Sleazy was the one that brought it into Martello Street but he couldn't pucker up properly and get a note out of it so um, he just handed it to me one day and said how do you do it and I just happened to do it first blast so I took over cornet from that day on and um, he went back to his little sample keyboard do you think it's easier to be irreverent with music if you're not classically trained? Or if, you don't, if you're not, not even classically trained, if you're not told how to do it? Possibly, because I think if there are no rules, then you're not aware of breaking any rules, are you? Mm. But, I mean, Sleazy had been trained 
I don't think he was taught to play the piano, wasn't he? L like I was. But um, so he's he's the one of all four of us that every now and again will say, "Well, that's not in tune," as as if it matters, you know. <laughs> but for some reason, it matters to him, you know. And you have to sort of like, you know, diplomatically, you know, spin things around a bit. But I think it is. But I I've always been of the the mind that. If you're not taught how to do something and you come in with a free mind, then anything is open to you and anything is possible. And I've always found when I've worked with um, trained musicians is that they seem to have a fallback formula to go on when they suddenly can't think what to do when they're improvising. And I think that's the worst thing about being trained mm. is that you have a fallback that's been programmed in you. Whereas if you've not been trained, you have no fallback and your imagination is endless. That's quite a scary place to be creatively for most people, though. What? Where you don't know what to do next? I think that's the best place, isn't it? But most people would disagree, I suspect. Uh, possibly. Would you disagree? No. no, I think it's the best the best place to be, to be honest, because that's where you've, you find new territory and most exciting territory, I think. I mean, I'm not interested in riffs or anything else like that. And I guess that's the difference between approaching something as a career where you need to have something to fall back on and so that you can continue in your career and doing something just because you want to. Yeah, totally. Mm. I mean, it, w working with trained musicians is quite um, a strange experience, really, <laughs> because I, I, I seem to sort of feel that I should try and untrain them <laughs> somehow. It's like breaking a horse or something. <laughs> but, you know, just loosen up, please don't do that. But you, you mentioned when you were talking about the things that you were using um, at this time, you mentioned the Roland, uh, which you mentioned some... Sp OK, you mentioned... With the some, bass line. Yeah, some specific yeah, equipment. Drum machine. That's right. How easy or hard was it to get that equipment at the time? It was really difficult for us because it was expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and we did try and get a Roland deal. <laughs> TG trying to get a Roland deal. Um, and we did a really sort of kitsch, you know, promo photo for him and sent it in. <laughs> but that was something that we used to enjoy in th doing things like that because we knew there was, you know, hiding to nothing really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was very difficult. I mean, when Chris got the um, 808, it was just like, you know, he was just so excited. He rushed down to Rod Argent's because he was the one that got the first ones in the UK and Chris got one of the first ones. But, um, yeah, it was very difficult because we had no money, basically. That, and Chris used to make all our stuff, but that's where the sound came from as well. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a hardship in a way because even when we bought the, the, the gear, Chris would modify it. We wouldn't use it out of the box. Because you were very early adopters of the 303 and the 808 as well. Mm. What what did you think, what, what did you want to do with them when you first got them? Well, we played with them at first as a novelty because we thought, oh, listen to this, it sounds just like, you know, like, and it, it was it was fun, you know. But then Chris started doing it for real and giving it the TG edge and that's, that's when it sort of came into its own for us, really. And so modifications, what, what were you, what were you doing? You can't ask me. The mod man's in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Which mods are you aware of? Well, the one, the first mods you had was on your keyboard, wasn't it, when we were in America with TG? Yeah. And we had trouble getting that out again, didn't we, back into the country? Why? Why, Chris? Uh, just to increase the, uh, the charges a lot. Um, I'd modified, I'd had it modified, this keyboard I bought in America, and uh, the company that did it um, sent me back some other bits to go with the keyboard, and customs wanted to charge me a lot of money for it. Yeah. Got really complicated. It's a boring story. So <laughs> he, he modified stuff himself at home after that, you know? Yeah. And so how much do you personally enjoy kind of getting involved in a piece of equipment and learning to use it and, and seeing what you can do with it? Well... Uh, I'm a, a very physical musician, so even even if I work with laptop now, I, I work with laptop and Ableton, but I have to have my fader fox. So I have the physical contact with things and feel things moving in and going out. 
So when I get a piece of equipment, like Chris shows me the basics of it so that I can get in and start working with it and see what it can do for me. I'm not, I don't particularly want to know the back-end story of it and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. to be honest, because I just need to know what it can do. Because I usually have an, a notion of what I want to use it for. Like Chris will say, this will be really good for you because of the way you work, you know. And so I say, in what way? And then he'll tell me. And then I'll say, well, get it for me. Show me how it works roughly. And then I'll start using it. But, I mean, one of the better, th one of the good things about that is that if you don't know how what something does or is supposed to do, like being trained with an instrument, then you come across something, and it's happened a few times, isn't it, in the studio, where I've done something. They said, how did you do that? And I said, I don't know, but <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it? And that's what I'm more interested in. Mm. You know, I mean, Chris is like, is super, super clever with gear. And I'm spoiled in that way that I can call on his expertise, you know. What pieces of equipment have you enjoyed kind of getting involved with recently? I suppose, yeah, the Fader Fox with Ableton has been my biggest shift ever. Mm -hmm. And um, doing samples and, you know, stretching, squeezing live and all that kind of stuff. I really enjoy that. Um yeah, it's, I think that was. And, and also getting guitar rig so that I can, you know, change my guitar even more. So, I mean, I, when we're on stage with TG, it's just... And I've seen in reviews afterwards, you know, Sleazy was great on that great bit of so-and-so, and I'm thinking, actually, he was drinking his wine at that point, and it was my guitar, but <laughs> never mind. But that's the kind of thing that happens within TG. You can't tell who does what, and that's the way we like it. I mean, you've got hands-on experience, sort of yourself and the outfits you've been involved with, with kind of those key bits of technology throughout the last 30 years or whatever. Um, what do you think are the kind of pros and cons of working with programmes like Ableton? I think the downside of it is that um, you can instantly recognise someone's using Ableton if they're just using it, you know, as is sort of thing. It does have its own kind of sound. But um, I really love it, especially for when we're doing live soundtracks and stuff like that, free-flowing um, material. I think it's it's brilliant for that. I, d I did a gig with um, a Russian guy that I did a project with. Um, I think it was a year before last Brussels, wasn't it? And that was fantastic. It was the first time I, I'd used it, like, on my own with... M with um, samples I'd done of, of him actually he'd sent, sent me some audio of his voice and stuff and then I'd sort of modified them and everything before I came out and then just played the clips and used the effects within Ableton and everything and it was brilliant I loved it but everyone knows how Ableton works it's it's really good but it's what you bring to it it's not it's not the machine or anything else it's what you bring to it so if we're thinking about the way that technology kind of tipped your music into different areas. What was it that tipped you kind of out of, I mean, obviously Throbbing Gristle, Throbbing Gristle finished and then you and Chris started making music together mm. as Chris and Cozy. Kind of which pieces of equipment kind of tipped you into the stuff that you were doing in the early days of Chris and Cozy? I suppose oh, Chris doing all the sequencing because we were... Um, well, I was still doing striptease then, so I had a load, a lot of different kind of music going on in clubs and things like that, and Chris was really interested in sequencing. And we just fancied doing something more lightweight like that, but with, with, a, with an edge to it and stuff, and, and that's why Chris and Cozy started off the way it did. I mean, there was a sort of crossover period with Heartbeat and Trance, but then came Love and Lust, and it was... That was Chris and Cozy sound. Really. So the the music was directly related to the artwork that you were doing with yourself as the artwork in the strip clubs and with the exhibitions that you were doing. Were I you did dance to TG. Separate? I danced to United. Did you? Yeah, and the guys in the pubs just couldn't figure out what was going on, <laughs> you know. And I, I danced to Love Lies Limp by Alternative TV as well. <laughs> that was that was a funny one. And Perubu. Mm -hmm. So I used to bring in. Um, a couple of you know songs now so would and you, again. So would you bring your own music with you when you went to a job? Very rarely. No, I was there incognito, if you like, and that was the best place to be because that's when you get the honest response from people in that situation. I wasn't into... No, no, I, I meant more. Did you transport your own little 
CD, well, no, CD player, sorry, no, your own there. little cassette player with you for the, to press play for the music for the gigs in the, the strip what? clubs, or was no, the you music had a DJ provided? There. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you just slip him some throbbing gristle to play? Go on, put this one on next for me. Rarely. <laughs> because it didn't go very well with strip tease, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was earning a living, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that must have been fantastically confusing for the uh, for the clients or whatever. I, word I used, used, funny enough, "Hard Working Man" by Perubu. Mm. I used solidly throughout doing striptease. It was a fantastic rhythm, and it was heavy, and it was dirty, mm -hmm. and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. But none of the other people I knew, except Eurythmics, I used to use some of their stuff. And so I think now is a time to listen to some kind of early Chris and Cozy so we get a kind of our sense of where we are. Mm. Um, what should we have? I don't know. Do you want crossover or do you want lightweight? Um, I think in the spirit of doing what you feel, you should do what you feel. Okay. This is from Songs of Love and Lust. But we wanted to bring all the knowledge and experience and emotions that preceded that into that little melting pot and see what came out of it with the present day, which was the sounds around the studio and everything else and the sounds that evoked particular feelings in us. Whereas the... Um, human people like that were totally different it was sort of I suppose it was a, a crisp clean look at now towards the future whereas we wanted a dirty look <laughs> <laughs> at the past and the dirty hands getting dirty feel to the present moving onwards to the future and there's a, a difference in, in I mean sometimes you can listen to this stuff and it sounds like it's roughly from the same area but the kind of idea that's propelling you forwards is pushing you in quite different directions. C can you give us a sense of the sort of breadth, again, for you know, some people to be very familiar with your music and some people less so. What's the kind of spectrum of Chris and Cozy and how it sounded at that time? Some of it sounded very beautiful and kind of exquisite mm. and some of it kind of uh, sort of um, channeling more of this sort of darker stuff that you're talking about. Can you find something on there that shows us a little bit of um, uh, idea about some of the sort of edges that Chris and Cozy would go to? Um, early or mid or mm, I guess we don't need to be too, uh, too chronological about it um. well there's a, Exotica was a very clean kind of sound for us and that's I suppose that's this was inspired by lounge music I th think there's a, dan a, a danger of because you make music, that as you listen to it, you analyse how it's been made. Mm. And that's one of the pitfalls of making music, that you can't enjoy some music because or you can hear, you recognise immediately some preset. That's usually what turns me off. And I think, lazy bastard. you know. And then I think that colours the rest of the track for me. Mm. Because I think, how could I think that was you know, good to put that on there when... It's going to appear in some like ad on TV any minute now because no one, you know, someone else has bought it and it's an easy thing to use. So there's that side of listening, but also I don't know. I think what gets me where, when I listen to things, usually what gets me is when I, I I can't figure out how they've done it or I haven't heard someone use that um, machine or instrument in that way before or it just sounds totally mental so uh, that's that's really good because something that's good's going to come out of that at some point because they're just like gone blah you know and that's the kind of stuff that excites me but as for practicing listening i don't know i don't know i think that smacks a little bit of forcing yourself to listen to something you're not enjoying just for the sake of listening and there's not enough time in our lives to be doing that <laughs> When you just talked about um, one of the things you like when you listen to things is the idea that something sounds completely mental. Mm. Um, can you tell us about a couple of experiences when you've had that with artists? So 
pieces of music or artists that you've been drawn to? It doesn't have to be now, although it could be now. Well, it happened yesterday, actually. That's, I that's went handy. To, yeah, I went to my MySpace just to sort out my friends and all that stuff. And um, there was a Korean girl who had sent me a little message just to say, you know, quoting on my thing, it says, my art is my life, my life is my art. And she said, um, my art is my life too. And so I went to, I clicked onto her MySpace page and went through and I looked, and it just said on there, first of all, I read that it's something about it. she's speaking in the third person. She doesn't know how anything works, but she doesn't care. And then I turned on the music and it was just great. It was just totally anarchic, but it had a kind of feel to it that immediately drew you in, you know, and, you, and made you smile and you think the energy of it came through which I suppose is what I'm interested in, is is people, you know, charging me with energy, with their music. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody is. That's what music's about. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this also might sound a little bit like the listening question, but I think it's interesting. Is, is there something that you always do before you start doing something? You know, some people need to, I don't know, go for a run or drink a cup of tea or do, as, you know, wear a certain piece of clothing. You know, some people have little things they will do before they start being creative, maybe a way of signalling that they're in that mood, mode, whatever. Um, is there anything that you do before you make music, or is it just... No, we, we tend to just... Um, we decide that it's about time we should get, get working <laughs> again for a like, start. Yeah, I'll pass four, get in the studio. Yeah, because you can't, until you get in there and turn all the gear on and start messing around, it ain't going to happen, you know. So we do that, but that's the only thing we do, is just turn on the gear and start thinking, what kind of mood are we in? Mm. And usually it goes from there. Some sound, you start off with something and you keep adding to it and it doesn't seem to go anywhere and you shelve it. And then you, s you play another sound, think, let's start from scratch. And then you suddenly realise, actually, what we just dumped would sound really good with this. Mm. And then you go back to that and bring it, you know, it's the usual... I mean, if people are talking about music, which is considered kind of high culture, then they'd always ask, how often do you know, how much people practice and all that kind of stuff? Like, how often are you in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's difficult. We don't practice. No, we're not, I'm not, we're not interested in practicing. I'm not asking about practicing. Because no, but what the I'm practice is, of, of making music, I know what you mean. It's just, I'm, I suppose I'm interested in how often you're in there or, or perhaps... I mean, it might be different. Obviously, you've got other things going on because you're a visual artist as well. So yeah. there's competing demands on your time between the different aspects of Chris what you is create. always in the studio. He's never out the studio doing either. Whether because the studio is where is the hub of everything, including all the website design, everything. So he's either doing website and the visuals are in there as well with video gear. So he's always in there. So if I'm doing stuff like admin for everything else that we've got to do because we we don't have a manager or anything we do everything ourselves so if i'm doing admin for our label or anything else or answering requests for remixes and stuff like that he's downstairs sourcing the tapes for things and all the rest of it so he's more in the studio than i am but we as far as practice goes we spend a lot of time obviously with tg stuff we've we've been in them uh, it's just been non-stop since we got back together again, really. That was 2004? 2002. Yeah, we got back to regrouped again. So um, finding the time to do our own material, which we regard as cartoony, really, is more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, we're starting a new album this year, actually. Um, but we'd spend a lot of time sort of doing remixes and that kind of thing, so, and tracks for compilations. So although we don't do our own stuff, we're still sort of doing music, but that's our lifeblood, is that we're launched into something that's not necessarily our territory, but it's interesting to us. So we don't ever sort of discount any, any kind of, um, you know, proposals from people, mm -hmm. because that's what we're about, you know. It's, we do a hell of a lot of... Um, collaborative work in those in those terms mm -hmm. i mean some of the collaborations you've done have been with people fairly close to you and some of them been with people who were apparently quite far removed certainly in terms of the sound of what they did um what for you makes a good collaboration um when it works out basically <laughs> <laughs> 
But no, a good collaboration is that you have that, um, you fever pitch of, of ideas that you throw at each other, not worrying about rejection because part of the whole collaboration thing is that somebody has to compromise at some point. This isn't your track, you know? <laughs> it's a comp collaboration. So, um, and learning the diplomacy of rejecting someone's idea. You know, you don't say, oh, that's shit. Or you could if you're really close to them, which is what we do in TG. But if it's with someone else, no, you, you know, you have to show some kind of respect for any ideas they throw in and kind of manoeuvre around things. You know. Have you got any tips for people who may find themselves in those collaborative situations? Um, from a recent experience of a collaboration going wrong, I would say make sure that you agree at the beginning this is going to be a 50-50 collaboration because that's what the spirit of collaborating is. No matter who does what, without one another it wouldn't happen. So it is 50-50. And, and what about... Um, collaboration as a way of expanding what's possible for you to do musically and um, perhaps taking yourself out of your comfort zone. I think that's crucial to collaborations and I think that's what's so great about them. Mm -hmm. And what's been an experience that you've had in collaboration that's done that for you? Um, the one I just spoke about that's gone bad. But um, <laughs> I mean, we talked <laughs> that a little bit. That was very much like that. About core and some of the collaborations on the core album. Um, we talked about Robert Wyatt mm. very briefly. What was that in terms... Of, uh, why was that an interesting collaboration for you? Because he's about as far removed away from what we do as anyone could get. Well, not quite, actually, because he is very experimental mm -hmm. in his music. But the fact that he's, um, he's structured in his music-making is very alien to us. But that's what he liked about working with us. And that's what we liked about working with him. So um, it would be working with Robert was a distance collaboration okay. because of his, um, he couldn't have got down to our studio physically because of his wheelchair and so on. But also he was very um, technophobic at the time as well, so he felt more comfortable sending us stuff um, on cassette, <laughs> <laughs> even though it wasn't so long ago. Yeah. Um, so, and he sent me lyrics as well, which were uh, words. They weren't lyrics at the time. They were like cut-ups. So he sent me a load of words and I made lyrics out of them, placed them in the song. And he also sent us some, um, some little snips of his voice going, do, 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 which we put in as a kind of little um, drum beat, really. And then sent that back to him. And then he sent back, and he sent back little harmonies, harmonised with bits of my pe my uh, vocal and things. So um, it was a great collaboration. And I think the thing with collaborations is, that is, a, a for instance, because if one person seems to have a flow, then I think it, it's good and very intuitive if someone can sit back while they're comfortable with that flow and let it happen and then come in and bring things to the piece. Because if you keep interrupting it, you're never going to get anywhere, and you're just going to piss each other off. Because it's a bit like saying, I can do better than that. You know, I want to put my drums in there now. You know, and that's not what it's about. It's about feeling your way through it together. Do you have any of core with you? Yeah, I do, actually. Keep it on there. Three, tra three tracks I've got down here. Got them all yeah, I know I've got them all on the other one. But I wonder if these are a little bit, you don't want to hear particularly 
Robert's the one, do you? Whatever you want to play. Yeah. I think the other ones are maybe. I can't find it, Chris. Where did you put it? <laughs> no, I want to play one of the other ones. Yeah. I think it's. This one was um, with with Coil. I don't know if any of you know Coil, but Sleazy was in Coil with uh, Jeff Rushton. And this this collaboration was was done similar to um, the one with Robert White. Yeah, that was it. Mm. When you were talking a minute ago about. Um, sort of this situation at home where Chris is in the studio and you're doing some other stuff as well when you're not in the studio and doing your other art. Um, you were talking about dealing with requests for people to license things. Um, which is the song which seems to be most requested or that you're still being asked about? Or does it change over time? It changes, but it it's usually October Love Song, um, Exotica's been asked for, um, Heartbeat, Re-Education Through Labour, Dancing Ghosts, and impulse, mm -hmm. the trans kind of era. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dancing Ghosts, that was one of the first tunes with the 808 on mm -hmm. it, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, um, why do you think people are still interested in that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think sometimes it's because it's from an album called Trans, and trans, and that was like when trans was 82. 82. And um, yet trans, as it's known now, has come all those years later, and yet they look back and they think trans way back then. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they listen to it and make the connection in that way, and it's the music on it is quite relevant to today still for that reason. And I guess that's the same kind of era as October Love Song as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it would be nice to give people a kind of sense of what those pieces sound like if mm. they don't already know. Could we have a little burst? Oh, Dancing Ghosts. Yeah. those years we were with those two labels and we played a lot in America uh, so um, I think because we'd done so much live work it did affect our studio work to be honest because it's so visceral when you play live and you want to get that you want to get that energy in in the records but at the same time the studio gives you that control to get it just how you want it so I think in in the 90s we started thinking about live work, I know it sounds really weird, but live work and studio work as two separate things. We had to, to keep our sanity really, because there's no way we wanted or could reproduce what we did in the studio on stage. And we sort of uh, accepted that as well, as part of our, um, of our, of our approach to our music is that we, we didn't mind the fact that we couldn't reproduce it live. We never did, to be honest, but there was an expectation because of the labels that we'd gone with. You know, I mean, play again some at the time, I'd two unlimited, you know. No, no, lame it. And all that kind of stuff. So there was a, a lot of that kind of going and doing PAs to a backing tape. Um, that just wasn't us, you know. So I think in, a, in that sense, we made a mental decision that what we took out live was live and it and that's how it sounded it wasn't going to be the record yes it would be that track mm -hmm. and it would be recognizable but it would have a life of its own mm -hmm. and there were technological shifts as well around yeah, we, that point we got a computer <laughs> which was like oh wow you know we don't need that huge mixing desk anymore and and that was just that was a huge turning point for us again ditch the samplers, you know, all those floppy disks and all that crap. So, yeah, that was a revolution and revelation for us as well. The way you're talking about it, it appears that it made you feel very free to be able to do that. What was it kind of that made you feel, what was the sort of freeness that you associate with that shift? I think when you work with some equipment, 
you fall into a kind of, you know, a rut almost. And there is a, an end to certain equipment at some at some point. And um, uh, even though to us, like the S900 and 950 and the 1000 that we got after that, it was a sampler and you only get out what you put in it. Just the physical action of doing that and the way you do that re repeatedly. You you were talking about the practice of recording. That in itself starts to, to give sort of taint the experience in a lot of ways because you want some other way of putting in and getting out. You know, it's hard to explain, but and the whole world opened up for us, you know, with software and everything, you know. So we could tweak and tweak to our heart's content, you know. And we didn't have the cost of tape, which was, you know, a big, big factor, you know. We we weren't in a position where we had a big record deal or had an advance or someone paying for us to do this. And we had a child to bring up as well, and those mundane things do impact on your creative life. So you have to start thinking school uniform or read a tape. You know, <laughs> stupid things like that when you're not earning any money out of your, your, your work. Yeah, those kind of small real-life things. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, and you just referenced it again, this thing of um, doing things yourselves, not having a manager, not having a big record deal. Um, I mean, there are some obvious advantages and disadvantages, but for you, what's the main advantage of doing things that way? Well, I don't think there's any disadvantage, to be honest. Because, Time. like in what? If you're, sometimes people prefer to shove that stuff off for someone else so they can just concentrate on the music. Well, I haven't got a clone of me that would know what I want, and that would have to be a man manager would have to be that. So, I I would be constantly if I had a manager going off and doing things like that, I would be constantly checking that they'd done the right thing, <laughs> and it's not a control freak thing with me. It's just the fact that I've never found anyone that could do that yet. You know, not even in TG. I mean, we have in TG got a manager, but even so. We're constantly going back and forth saying, make sure it's not like that, it's this, otherwise, you know, it's just not going to work. So I don't see a disadvantage other than, yeah, I haven't got all the time in the world to do everything, but the freedom it gives me to be independent is uh, worth that. So was it around the time of, you're talking about sort of making a decisive shift between live and studio? Um, so that's... Uh, so which albums are you talking about there, or are we starting to get to the point where... Well, from Exotica, I mean, I think Exotica, because that's... Would you agree? That was very produced. I mean, even Love and Lust was still a little bit raw. Um, but Exotica was the one that was very produced. Mm. And we knew when we did that, I mean, we loved it. And we knew that we would never can be able to do this live. But so what? It's great as a, as a record, you know. So, yeah, that flip happened then. But if you're thinking about the, the last album that you put out, what's the connection between the kind of live, any live representation of it and the music itself and some of the artwork or the films, the vignettes that you've done that go along with it? Well, the, always when we've done, and we've, as Chris and Cozy, we've always done video um, visuals when we played live, always. Mm -hmm. and, and also kind of... Uh, destroying or messing about with the video equipment in the same way as you were with the samplers. Yeah, mm. yeah. So the videos were always like cut-ups and mash-ups and mm -hmm. all kinds of things going on. But prior to that, it was slides and film. So um, there were always multi-layers of things going on. And it, first of all, start, started, off, started off where we, we wanted people, the visuals to not distract people from us, but just lose themselves in the sound and forget that we were performing it. Mm -hmm. Because then you get over that thing of someone performing the song off the album, which is what I was talking about, and they go there just for what you are creating for them right there and then. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested in people seeing me on the front of the stage, you know, <coughs> front in a band or anything. All I'm interested in is doing the music. So it was a way of making them connect with something visual. And those visuals represented... Uh, would represent a feeling or an emotion or a warmth or a coldness about the tracks that we would be playing live, and they still do. But now more so, they're not cut-ups and random, because we used to rely a lot on random chants with those, which was great. Um, but now we do little vignettes more. 
for the last album, we did like vignettes for tracks. So do you have something from Feral Vapors to show us? Yeah, I have a, a video, please. I think it looked better on my laptop, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise for that. Um, so how do you think... I know external perceptions aren't really what you're interested in, um, but how do you think external perceptions of what you do have changed over the years? Um, how do people see what you did? How do people see it then? And how do people see it now? And how has that changed? I think just by the very fact that, you know, the way time works <laughs> is that people, unless they come to you from nowhere, they come to you from knowing some of your history. Therefore, that paints how they see you now. And that's, you know, inevitable, really. And before we hand over to these guys to see what they want to ask you, and I'm sure they'll have lots of other things to ask you, um, what's, the, what's the single thing you think you can do to remain creatively interesting or creatively interested? Oh, it's a difficult one. I think to do it for yourself and not... I mean, I'm, that's a contradiction in terms because you're doing it for other people to share it with them. But what I'm talking about is you know yourself whether you're expressing who you are the minute you start expressing something for someone else, then there's a kind of betrayal there and you've left yourself behind somewhere. And it's a long road back because I've known a lot of people like that that have started off doing great music and been um, seduced by Hollywood and everything else and they just can't get back. And they're rather unhappy but very rich, which seems to go hand in hand. But if that's the lifestyle you want, that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, I like that, that idea of sort of if you betray yourself, it actually being very hard to come back from. It's a really interesting way to suddenly start compartmentalising the routes people take. But I guess that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. um, shall we throw questions out to over here? So before you ask your question, you just need to wait for the microphone. Otherwise, it won't be recorded and everyone else won't gain the benefit sure. of what you're asking. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, purely from a a perspective of someone listening to the music and seeing the covers and kind of having it, you know, knowing about the, the bands that are kind of friends of Throbbing Gristle and Chris and Cozy and stuff like, like David Tibet and stuff like that. Uh, this, this may be a, f a flawed perspective, but somehow it feels like there's always this content that is about something mystical and almost occult, like like you guys are trying to decode something through the music. What, what I'm I'm really curious about this part of uh, maybe it's not really important for the other people, <laughs> but I'm well, really curious. I think the reason you do music is important to anyone really, so that's, that's the relevance of the question. Um, it's when you're interested in things like the occult um, and magic with a capital with a K and so on, and that kind of lifestyle and just um, connecting with yourself on that level rather than on a, on a superficial level, it's more about that. It's um, <laughs> denying superficiality really and getting inside yourself and inside other people and hopefully finding those triggers and finding one with one another, that's what it's about. And I think music generally is about that, whether it's just to go out dancing and getting, you know, off your head or whatever. But for me, that has turned into some kind of superficial act now because getting out of your head in the 60s and 70s is very different to how they do it now and the reasons why they do it now. It doesn't lead to anywhere... Um, any advancement, it tends to hold people back. And I'm very much against that kind of um, uh, 
activity because to me it smacks of a form of control. When people are that drugged up and so on, you can keep them where you want them, basically. Even if they cause trouble, you can... You've got a bill for that, you know. You've got an amount of money to spend on that. They're not doing anything else politically active, that's for sure. Uh, just another thing. So that comes... That the, what you're saying about, you know, nowadays club culture and stuff... Um, and I'm, I'm talking and about club sure. culture as in I know, binge I know, drinking I know. kind of club sure. culture, not the subcultures that are really interesting. Sure, sure. But um, I, I remember reading in an interview from Andy Blake from the label Dissident, which I kind of knew. Um, he said something about some club music can be like a pacifying way of a pacifying thing you know for for a crowd instead of what you were saying about charging people with energy mm -hmm. so do you think it's kind of uh, meant to be that way thing that's a big question am I supposed to answer that <laughs> <laughs> we're getting into philosophy <laughs> Sorry. Um, no I don't apologise I, th I think there there is always that conflict in society because without it I mean you have to have black and white to s then start pushing against you know the barriers and, and start changing things because if you have no black you can't say hang on a minute what about this so in some ways it's um, you know you've got to have the, the thing that you're fighting against there but on the, on the other hand I don't think it needs to be quite as destructive as it is now I mean, I, I don't, because I've been here a lot longer than you. I know that those kind of club scenes that were just hedonistic weren't as destructive as they are now, you know. And with the, you know, the internet on top of that, which removes people from one to one even more, then it's even more damaging, you know, to then make go out and maintain that, and just sort of um, tick off lists of things to do and never really connect properly with those um, activities, you know. Now, I'm talking about things, people going and seeing all these fantastic sites and everything. Oh, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. But how long did you do it? Well, I went out there for two weeks, you know. But that's not what I'm talking about. Most people, uh, they engage with something for a very long time because they want something out of it, whether they agree with it or not, whether they use it to move forward or not. At least then they've accessed that information and knowledge Whereas I don't think a lot of people do nowadays. I think it's just so instantaneous on the internet to, to sort of look things up and not go and actually physically interact with things, which is what we're talking about with one, one type of club to another. Yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> we have another question over here. Um, I just wanted to thank you um, for being here, first of all. And I really find, um, I really appreciate in your music, it's very moody, it's very visual, and it evokes different types of emotions. And um, one thing that I find as a vocalist is that sometimes, an uh, untrained vocalist at that, is that sometimes people want you to sing a certain way to evoke a certain type of feeling and it's usually always the same feelings it's like you know uh, when they hear the song they want to feel cool or they want to feel sexy they want to feel strong and it's constantly these same feelings that it's people about them isn't it yeah <laughs> you know. if it comes from you they'll get what they want right yeah. and i just um i just wondered if you ever felt that type of of pressure to to not explore other you know ranges of emotion and feeling and and to stick to you know i mean i find a lot of this in mainstream music it's constantly focused on these types of feelings when you can escape in a variety i think yeah. of emotions and feelings and not just these same ones that i feel are constantly being you know you want to go out and feel strong uh, feel really cool in the club and 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 wanting to make music that 
reflects that. Yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can communicate and say things in very different ways, even vocally. You don't even have to use words, yeah. which you probably know that if you're not a trained <laughs> singer. And um, also, I, I think that with, with vocals is that um, I think everyone has their own unique voice. And I think you find that yourself yeah. by just expressing your feelings, to be honest. So when someone comes in and says, can you sing this? It's in this key, which means absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Chris will <laughs> back me up on that. And I, I just, I go by the music. I don't know about you, but I, I go by the music and how what sound I can create from my body will go with that. Yeah. I'm a sound box. I'm not a vocalist, really. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's certain words I want to get across, like with on the last album, there was specifically, it's a very um, emotional album that we did over things we were talking earlier, over things that had happened to us and members of our family and just around the world in the last four years that were quite devastating. So the words in that respect were really important. But more than that was the, the timbre of the voice and how you said the words and, um, and how they... Um, sat with the sounds that you put with them so for someone to come and start telling you how to sing you know it's like telling the piano how to play mm -hmm. it's crazy mm -hmm. you know but you, you have to have that mental leap from you know not everybody has it mm -hmm. so thank you okay where's the microphone going next hi um some of us here might um, are, are probably still in the process of trying to find their own sound, their own their own philosophy or their own approach to how what music is and what sound is and what what I, what identifies themselves. So, um, what advice do you have for somebody who's just sort of in the beginning or in the, in the beginning or in the process of trying to figure out um, what sort of sound or what sort of image defines him or her? Um, it's very difficult because, you know, I, I've said that you have to feel your way through and you have to open yourself up as a conduit, really, when you do music. And that, that's the key to it. But at the same time, you're looking for something, so it's very difficult. You're in a, a real sort of, like, push-pull situation the whole time. But, I mean, I'm sure yourself, when you've done some kind of music, you've recognised that feeling, that it just feels right, and you don't know why and you don't know how it happened so quickly, but suddenly you've got a, a track or something within 30 minutes, and it took you four days to do the last one. But those moments are really magical, and they're few and far between, I think. But I think if, you, if that's happened to you, and, and you cling to that and try and remember that feeling, I don't think that... I think that's what you have to remember all the time. It, it's very difficult to explain... Um, but I think it's one of the most exciting moments, to be honest, to be where you are, because you have no history yet. It's all to come, you know, and it's that's really exciting. But it's also really difficult, very, very difficult. But you must know yourself that when things sit well with you, do you not? Yeah. I think that's all you can go by. You'd not worry about someone else, because, you know, history tells us that the, some of the greatest artists and musicians have been slam dunked no end of times for what they did and now they're heralded and as geniuses. And who next? Hello. hello. Hi. Yeah, I'll get up so you can see me. Thanks. Okay, so um, being a woman in, in the music industry, uh, did it, uh, did you get any discrimination in the early years, or do you still get it sometimes? Um, we were talking about this earlier, actually, whether we wanted to bring up the issue of gender, mm. because music is music. But I understand what you're saying, yeah. and more so now, because I get that more now, ironically, than I did in the 70s, mm. which is really weird for me. Do you think that's because the 70s was more political, so people would have been more kind of um they were too busy to being they were too busy being active there was too much to put right in the 70s now there's so much pass passivity in people and 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 such a lot of like um i don't know 
ego, I want to be there kind of attitude, that it's got to the point where they are being quite derogatory towards women. And I've found that, which it's, it shocked me, to be honest, because I've never even thought, the thought has never gone through my mind that I'm a woman doing music until the last three, four years when I've had it shoved in my face that, like, hang on a minute, he meant that because I'm a woman. That is weird. Mm. <laughs> I, I can't quite grasp that because in my mind, human beings are human beings and it makes no bloody difference what sex you are, other than when you get together, obviously. But, um, you know, as far as everything else goes, I mean... You know, I'm not a dog, I'm not a bird, I'm not a mouse, so why is it a big deal? I, I'm doing music, you know. But I understand where you're coming from. And no, the only time I got it in the 70s was when um, a Japanese um, reporter came and asked me what it was like to be the only girl in the band of Throbbing Gristle. And we all looked and went, what? <laughs> because like I said earlier, I mean, with TG now and... Jen's gone transgender. I mean, that's a question you can't even answer anyway because there's one half and me and two blokes and one's gay. So, I mean, it doesn't really... doesn't matter. But it does to some people, which is, a, I think, becoming a problem. OK, so do we have any final questions? Or is now time just to say thank you very much. Thank Cozy you. Thank you, everybody.